Thank you, Misha. Thank you, everybody, for staying with us. Um, one of the problems with um, classical Greek drama is that it's usually free of psychological suspense. It's not changing opinions of the characters that will determine what will happen. It is rather the implementation of fate through different factors. We see that in the humanities. Orestes doesn't have a sudden crisis of conscience, doesn't change his mind about his act. He remains on the path, true to message. Apollo is not going to dump him. Apollo has plans of his own. Athena agrees with Apollo for her own divine reasons. Even the mortals who make up the jury that Athena convenes um, are split evenly um, in their assessment of Orestes, which since they are not individualized, they are here as a collective, simply means they can't make up their mind, but doesn't indicate that they will change it. In fact, the only characters that do change their mind are, of course, the Furies. The Furies who first accept against their nature to defer to a judgment by Athena, in fact, the judgment by mere mortals, as Lorraine has pointed out to us. And then even more surprisingly, decide to give up on what they are, those horrible, devastating deities that track down and punish crime, and accept a much more benign role as underground benefactors of Athens. But can a fury retire? Can the fury, instead of hunting down the evil mortals sit comfortably in an underground home in Athens, um, drinking retina and dispersing pearls of wisdom amongst admiring Athenian youth. It's such a pity that the Aristia doesn't have a fourth part, which would show what life under the blessing of the Furies would now become the humanities, was like in Athens. We can have some kind of idea of what it was like. Um, historically, that would have been the period of Athens' glory, um, the rise of Athenian democracy under Pericles, Athenian military power, ensuring domination of the seas. And then the gradual but unavoidable downfall of Athens, the breakup of democracy, the tyrants that return if briefly. However, Aeschylus has not left us such a work, but I think it is useful and interesting to try to imagine what life under retired furies or above retired furies, rather, would have been like. Before we do that, however, let's look at how furies, as opposed to other characters in the humanities, make us feel. Orestes, frankly, doesn't inspire much sympathy. It is difficult like someone who's murdered his mother, even if, and this is an important factor, we sort of understand what make him do it. Um, having your mother murder your father isn't fun, and people can react violently to such a development. So we tend to be understanding of his act even if we don't necessarily like the person. 
Apollo and Athena, of course, are divine schemers, um, not interested in human sympathy, not getting much of it, but easily understandable to us. Furies seem to come from a different category. They are repellent, inspire revulsion. Their mere physical appearance is a horror. And we really find it difficult to empathize or even understand what makes them tick. Orestes, sure, he is avenging a murder in the family. Um, this is something that all of us can understand. But why is it that the Furies want to track him down and execute him? He didn't murder anybody of their family. What seems to make the Furies tick is an abstract concept of justice. The idea that the world in which an Orestes remains unpunished is a world not at rights. There's a world which is flowed, which is damaged. And it is their mission, the Furies mission, to set the world straight again by eliminating the human who has caused all this damage. And herein, perhaps, lies the reason why we not really like the Furies. We mistrust them because um, divine as they are, they make us think of other humans whom we've run into if we were lucky on the pages of history books, if we were less lucky in person, who knew that the world will be set right if only so-and-so gets killed. And um, once this is presented to us, um, almost regardless of what so-and-so has done or is supposed to have done, um, we tend to take a dim view of the Furies that want him eliminated. We've seen this play time and time over. No, nothing gets repaired. And yes, in all probability, instead of justice, we get more injustice, injustice for the man who was eliminated. So I'm trying to imagine myself an Athenian with Furies, reformed Furies, retired Furies in my basement, and trying to think, what is it that they would do? Okay, by definition, if you're retired, um, you're supposed not to do your work anymore. I'm still trying to learn that myself. But retirement cannot mean you give up on who you are. The Furies don't persecute criminals as work. They do it as their nature. This is who they are. But they've promised Athena that they'll give it up. Not only that, they will not even wreak revenge on the land which tolerates the existence of criminals um, they had very clearly said that um, they will punish Athens if Orestes doesn't get punished himself. Um, something of a non sequitur, but pretty credible to the inhabitants of Athens. So yes, the Furies have said that they will not, no longer engage in horrible murder motivated by the desire for justice. Although, frankly, the fact that Orestes eventually dies of snake bite makes one suspicious. Um, the Furies had a close and intimate relationship with snakes. And having Orestes die of snake bite seems similar to the attempt to say, kill Sergei Skripal um, in Salisbury with Novichok. 
Not that the FSB is doing it in broad daylight, although as, as the story developed, turned out they really were, but it is, <coughs> sorry, like a trademark um, left on the site for all those interested to know. So maybe a fury or two took a day off to travel to August and finish all on set, unfinished business, um, still believing they're keeping the deal with Athena by not doing it in public, just leaving a sign for those in the know to know. But furies are about eliminating heinous crime. Um, let us assume that they don't do more Argus operations. If they do not kill, well, as a bare minimum, they must prevent. In fact, this is what a mature fury would probably do. So much simpler to eliminate the criminal before the act than after, less damage done. And here one thinks of Ischylus himself. Um, who was in Athens put on trial for having betrayed in his plays the secrets of the Delphic mysteries, eventually, of course, exonerated because of his and his brother's glorious military service to the city. But he might have suffered the fate of Socrates, who was, after all, eliminated for a crime very similar. But come to think of it, the death of his hills is kind of suspicious. As we know, a vulture dropped a turtle on his head, mistaking his bowl plate for a stone that vultures would drop turtles on to break their carapace and eat their meat. It's not a very typical way of passing. It is almost as if somebody left another signature, completely snake free, but just pointing out, um, if you get yourself in trouble, well, you won't get out of trouble and somebody will take care of you. Athens, blessed by the Furies because um, they were, were promised to switch from curse to blessing, would probably be this kind of society in which the Furies discreetly guide young Athenians, no more public operations for us were retired, into tracking down, identifying, and eliminating future dangers. Indeed, a much more noble calling than drinking the blood of murderers after the fact. But what, in fact, is wrong with that? A murderer who has been prevented from murdering um, is somebody eliminated from society, prevented to do evil? All right, um, maybe killing just because somebody had the idea to kill someone else, or a retired fury says he did, is not the most gentle way of going about it, but there are other solutions. There's exile, there's public discreditation, you can always run a compromat information operation against such a person, and no blood is spilled. And yet, we tend to mistrust operators of this kind. We tend rather to think of ourselves as endangered, not protected by the blessings of retired furies.
And this, in fact, tends to reflect backwards on our attitudes towards revenge. As I said, we have an understanding for Orestes. Um, we do feel that there is something legitimate, natural, in fact, familiar in revenge for a great wrong. Even if that revenge itself is horrible and inhuman. Our problem with the Furies is not what they did before they retired. It's the reasons that made them do it. The abstract desire for justice instead of the natural and human desire for revenge. We're probably all familiar with the Avengers, the operation that Abba Kovner, a veteran of the Jewish resistance in Vilno, set up immediately after World War II, trying to murder in revenge for the Shoah as many Germans as possible. This involved plans to poison the water supply of Nuremberg and the apparently performed project of poisoning the bread in that German POW camp in the American zone. Um, we have no doubt that those acts are horrible and that they deserve unconditional and unrestrained condemnation. And yet we do not condemn Kovner for having planned them. In a way we understand even if we do not want to accept the consequences of our understanding. Kovner wanted to become a mass murderer because he was a victim of mass murder. He wanted revenge. This we can understand. Somehow it's very difficult to feel any sympathy for Robespierre, even though abstractly, intellectually, some of us at least might consider that murdering the enemies of the Republic was politically necessary and therefore justified. There is something in killings committed out of ideology, even if we agree with that ideology, that makes them abhorrent the way that killings committed out of a desire for revenge are not experienced that way, which almost makes one ask if the Furies were really physically, materially as disgusting as as Hillas portrays them to be, or is this simply an externalization of our feelings about them, our revulsion at what they do and why they do it? But a retired fury, does a retired fury really deserve the same kind of condemnation? Though they're all feminine, I somehow imagine a retired fury sitting in her, his, its study, gender here becomes fluid, and smoking a pipe. This is what retired people do. I was myself a pipe smoker for much of my life, so maybe this is where the pipe motive comes in. Sipping a decent whiskey or even a retina and disbursing advice, teaching young generations what they should do to avoid having to, con uh, to hunt criminals down. What are the appropriate methods of social engineering which would prevent all the undesirable bloody outcomes 
murder first, execution second. And yes, we have all either met or read about such retired furies, about people who in their youth were tracking down criminals or potential crim criminals, enemies or suspected enemies, and killing them bloodily in the name of an ideal, only later to become great thinkers, intellectuals, philosophers, people whose books we read and respect and revere. So maybe after all, a fury can change her skin, not only her spots, but her skin in fact, and become somebody else. Maybe fury is just a stage that if we are lucky, we can outgrow. Maybe. If I had a choice, I wouldn't make Athens above the Furies. This actually would make a great change of name. A Athens above the Furies, like London on Thames. I would not make Athens above the Furies my place of residence. It would probably be a safe place. In fact, the mere knowledge that the Furies are still there watching would probably deter even the most hardened criminal or thought criminal from endangering the social peace of the city. And indeed, Athenians could in fact flourish knowing that ultimately their security is there in the basement. Retired, yes. Mellowed down, possibly. A fury still, although we call it, we call them the humanities. I would not feel safe in Athens, and I would not feel safe with people who feel safe in Athens, which is, of course, an extremely egocentric perspective on it because clearly the greater common good is served by yes, having a retired fury in your basement, taking care of the security of the city. And frankly, it is not even the retired fury that worries me. Maybe furies do mellow down with age, maybe this reversal of curse into blessing changes them also on the inside from a killing machine to a thinking machine, possibly even a compassionate one. The real problem with retired furies is their students. Their students for whom the stories of tracking down matricides, biting their necks and licking their blood are just stories, just words. They never had to drink blood. They were never spattered with brains. They miss it. The good old bad old days when humans and gods battled, slipped on disemboweled bodies, stood for something. In Athens at peace, what can the students of Furies do? No more criminals to hunt down, no more battles to fight. A gifted student can only, always find a battle. In Poland today, a group of young historians has started a movement to cleanse the national cemetery of remnants of communists who defile the soil in which they lie, um, are an insult to good Poles who go to the cemetery to visit their good patriotic 
parents, family members, friends who had nothing to do with communism. And therefore, it is only logical that the way that we cleanse the city of the living, if they endanger the security of the city, we should cleanse the lands of the city of the dead whose memory defiles the land. And once we've done that, there is still more to cleanse. There is the entire past that was wrong, full of mistakes, crimes, stupidities, shame, all that past to cleanse and revise so that it will no longer be a threat. It won't make us think, it won't make us pause, it won't make us afraid or shameful or simply sad. If I were a fury, I would be very, very afraid of my students, much more than of my sisters or my reflection in the mirror. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kostnik. Oh, wow. Extremely oh, wow. eloquent and also very disquieting. <laughs> um, while people are collecting their thoughts and, and preparing to ask questions, I, I must say I had to think of one particular retired fury as you were uh, speaking, namely Rafi Eitan, who led the operation to capture Eichmann mm -hmm. uh, as, as a member of the Mossad and who uh, shortly before his death uh, recorded a video message in support of the German far-right IFD party, uh, whom he, he praised uh, apparently because of their um, very rigid stance on Muslims. Um, so I think that, you know, you, you don't even need to go as far as the students, even the retired Fury, him or herself, uh, can, can say some very troubling things. Um, but I don't want to take any time from the discussion. Um, who wants to start? Susan, um, raise her hand. So um, just one question, uh, Kostek, because uh, you will be surprised at how much in half an hour when I start talking, how much our views converge in interesting ways. Um, but the one question that I want to ask, and um, Glenn may also want to weigh in on this, uh, you ask quite rightly whether a fury can change her nature but of course, it's very striking that they change their names. And given a, a bit that I know about the importance of naming in, you know, in Greece, and you see it in the Odyssey and various places, I just wonder how much that counts. Look, I wish I knew, although I also would prefer not to find out personally, my curiosity here is strictly intellectual. And I also wish to, would, would wish to know what is the cause and what is the effect? Is it that we all agree that once we call furies humanities, this means that we have nothing more to fear from them? No, seriously, they're no longer a threat. They're actually good. Look, look at the name, the name says it all. Or is it that the change of the name is a reflection of a true change of nature? And do we know until the moment of the test comes? Glenn. Uh, thank you uh, for a wonderful very moving and very disquieting talk, Constant. Um, I wanted to say something about Susan's question and then ask you a question. Um, Susan, uh, what's in a name? The Arrhenes, the name was thought by the Greeks to come from Eris, which means strife. And they were called the Eumenides euphemistically in the same way as the word for left is lucky and the way the word for night is beneficent. Um, what happens in Aeschylus is that they really do become humanities. They become um, 
beneficent, um, so that what had been a euphemism suddenly turns out to be true. The, one of the strange things about the text of the play is that the word humanities never appears in the text anywhere. Some people think that there is a lacuna um, in, which that, in which they were renamed. Um, and th there's no good reason to, do, to think that, except that it is very odd in this play that, there, that the name and the change of the name is not indicated. Um, Constant, I wanted to ask you a question, if I may. Um, how does Christianity change the notion of becoming a completely different person when one retires? Christianity is filled with um, tales of saints who were tremendous sinners in their salad days, and then realized the mistakenness of their ways and became saints. There's really nothing like that in Greek that I know of. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that if the Irenees had been Christian, their retirement would have been different? Well, frankly, when you ask your question, I started thinking, when was the, the last time when somebody asked me about Christianity? And it was maybe when I was trying to explain the world to my children when, when they were very small. I, I cannot consider myself knowledgeable about Christianity, but I think that the real issue in the genuineness of the transformation is whether you start thinking of what you had done before as wrong. This is what happened, if I understand correctly, in the hagiographies, to the great sinners who then became great saints. They first had to have a real hashbon hanefesh, a real accounting for the soul, an internal transformation that then allowed them to do good possibly with the same passion and determination as the evil they had done before. The alternative here are the genocidaires, the perpetrators of genocide, the old Nazis in Germany, um, the Hutu power prisoners in Kigali, um, Serb nationalists in Bosnia, people who I've spoken to, who genuinely believed they had done nothing wrong and who lived to a peaceful old age and peacefully die in their beds, their conscience clean. It is what Himmler said in his Posen speech in 43, we have not taken even one fennig for ourselves. Therefore, we are clean. The perpetrators of genocide are moral people who do horrible things precisely because they serve a good purpose. Sinners are people who realized they had sins, they had sinned, and therefore could break with it. So yes, I do think that a genuine transformation is possible both within Christianity and outside of it, it really depends on how strongly you believe that whatever you did, you're a moral person. The stronger the belief, the smaller the chance. Thank you. Rainy is next, and then we have a comment in the Q&A. Thank you. I love the image of the Furies in their basement apartment twiddling their thumbs looking for some gainful occupation. <laughs> I, have, I have an idea of what's happened to them, but my question is, um, it, it, Athena says um, in the transition from the Furies to the Humanities, the kindly ones, she says, there's not going to be any law unless there's still terror in the hearts of people. So it, in a sense, what she's saying is, 
maybe the, the Furies will change their nature, but frankly, humans aren't going to change their nature. Um, there's going to have to be some terror at the basis even of this new legal system. And I guess my question for you is, um, do you think that's right? I mean, do you think that it's possible to get rid of that terror? And my candidates, by the way, for the Furies, I saw two of them on the bus in Berlin today. The one thing the Furies care about is that the younger generation respect the older generation. And there are little old ladies in Berlin who are really, I am sure, retired Furies, making sure that young people give up their seats for them on the bus. <laughs> I, um, I've been wondering about this Athena quote because she doesn't say what is it that people should live in terror of. And there are at least two possibilities. One is terror of retaliation. What happens to me if I do wrong and get caught? And the other is terror of a lawless society. What happens to all of us if we cannot agree to uphold the law? These are two very different terrors. And I think here of the seven commandments binding in Judaism on all humanity that are the basis of the covenant that God made with Noah. And the first of those seven is to have a law. God doesn't tell humanity what that law is supposed to be, but it tells humanity you cannot survive without having a law and obeying it. I frankly think with terror of a lawless society even if composed of angels exclusively. And if this is what Athena meant, I'm with her. We now have a comment in the Q&A from Mario Kessler, who says, uh, you mentioned Abba Kovner and the Nakam operation. May I politely supplement that many facts about the operation are still disputed. Kovner wrote, wrote later that Chaim Weizmann assisted him in obtaining the poison by referring him to Ernst Bergmann, the same Bergmann who later built Israel's first atom bomb. Bergmann allegedly provided the poison and a backer. But Weizmann was, at the disputed time in 1945, not in Palestine, and Ernst Bergmann did not provide any poison to anyone, signed Mario Kessler, historian and friend of the Bergmann family. Um, so the comment is absolutely true. Um, what I did say is that there was allegedly a plan to poison the waterworks of Nuremberg, and there was probably an effective attempt to poison the bread in the German POW camp. And obviously, the details of the fact are in dispute. The very existence of such an operation is not. And I brought it in here to show how complex our attitude towards revenge is, which means that even if we unreservedly condemn, and I would assume anybody in their right or left mind would unreservedly condemn whatever it is that Kovner had in mind, this does not automatically entail condemning the man who had this, those horrible things in mind, because we can understand where it comes from, the way we cannot understand the Furies. I would add that there is now a song about that operation by Daniel Kahn, um, mm. which has very interesting things to say about vengeance and justice. But Stephen Holmes is next. Yeah, that was wonderful. I was like, but just a clarification. You're saying that the Furies are really not symbols of revenge. I mean, they, they have no personal motive. So this is a very, this is quite different than everything we've been thinking. I think it's a way of the most radical. And the reason you are afraid of them, they seem to, they remind you of a kind of 
principled fanatics who, whose motives are impenetrable to you in a way that they don't, they don't see, you, you can't trace to them any motive with which you could identify somehow. Is that it? So just say a, a, another word about why okay. you find them so frightening and who they really remind you of. Well, first of all, no, no, the, the Furies absolutely are out for revenge, but they don't want to avenge personal wrongs done to them, family members or friends but the wrong done to the idea of justice. And this is what makes the Furies fundamentally different from Orestes. And in all honesty, um, there is an obvious fundamental contradiction in, between being afraid of a lawless world and being afraid of the enforcers of the, of the law, right? Um, in good logic, it's either or. If I'm afraid of a world without a law, and I am, I should not be afraid of the furies that want to make sure that others don't break the law. But I am afraid of both. Um, Maybe because even if I could identify the set of values that I would allow furies to operate upon and which theoretically should take care of my fear, I still would be afraid of a world in which one individual can tell the furies what is it right and what is wrong to revenge and prosecute. I, I see no way out of this dilemma uh, other than the wishy-washy trying to avoid the extremes, which doesn't really work. Um, so um, whatever is being reconciled with Athena, there, there, are, there are conflicting ideas of justice. I mean, certain, certainly the notion that justice is something that justice by itself unifies people can't be true because there are two strong ideas of DK which are opposed to each other. And somehow the split verdict means that neither is really completely wrong. And, but if we don't find a way to reconcile them, there will be civil war. This is also in a way a question for Rainey mm -hmm. because it doesn't seem to be just in the house of Atreus. This is, Athena talks about civil war in Athens. It will be civil war not in the oikos of Orestes, but in, in, our, but in, in Athens, it's gonna be a civil war somehow. So whatever, whatever this is, this higher, no, I mean, that has to do with what, year, what happens when the furies retire, I guess. But somehow that, the claim, it must be the claim to have the only idea of justice. Is that what it is? Is, to, uh, that, is, it, is it an abstract idea? because it's abstract and not personal, that was what I, I gathered from you, or because it's partial? Uh, what I'm asking you. You're just rephrasing the dilemma. Because yeah. yes, um, I am afraid of the one idea of justice, but on the other hand, this one idea, the, the uh, concept that there is one justice is a logical consequence of the first commandment of the covenant with Noah, right? Make yourself alone. Uh, I don't think that this is a dilemma that can be resolved by humans. The only good logical solution is, well, it's up to God and God will decide and God will choose the righteous and the sinners. But this is unsatisfactory for so many other reasons, apart from being cowardly. <laughs> so I'm stuck. <laughs>